and I'm glad to see Bob back at HBO. And I'm I'm actually glad he's back on one of my radio shows too. So how are you doing, old friend? Not old hey, as Bernie. In, how are you? Nice to talk with you. Nice to talk with you. How how, how much are you enjoying um, being back to one of your homes? You know, HBO. Very, very, very much. HBO was always a natural fit for me. Uh, it didn't take uh, much huddling to come up with the name of this show. It's back on the record because the first iteration was on the record between 2001 and 2009. Uh, and now I'm back and it's, you know, hand in glove stuff. It's the kind of thing, not the only thing that I like to do, but it's among the things I most like to do. Long form interviews, chance for commentary, uh, which most shows, the last one didn't because we were kind of overbooked and Billy Crystal was so good that we didn't have enough time for me to do the usual closing commentary on one subject or another uh, that generally ends the show, but that's usually part of it. And then the panel discussions, it, you know, it just has a kind of texture to it um, that you don't find most places on television, but HBO is one of the platforms that lets you do that. I wanted to give you a compliment, uh, not that you need it, but Everyone likes to hear a kind word. I, you know, I've uh, I covered Jerry Jones actually in Dallas when he bought the team. I was working for the Dallas Morning News. I've had a chance to interview him many times, but that's neither here nor there. Seen him, seen a million interviews with him. I thought your interview with him w- was exceptional. I mean, I, I it, everything about it was just uh, riveting. I he he whether you like him or not, he's he's interesting and he's entertaining and he's got things to say and he's colorful and he yes, sort of keeps you. In, yeah, he keeps showing your toes. Um, w- what was that like? It's not like the first time you ever talked to him, but what was that like? And I've interviewed him before. In fact, once on NBC for Sunday Night Football, I got him to admit that as the owner, he would have fired Jerry Jones, the general manager. <laughs> if, if someone named Jerry Smith or Jerry Johnson had done the same job, and this was probably, I don't know, around 2015, something like that, maybe 2014, when this interview took place, evaluating it objectively, would you, Jerry Jones, the owner, have fired Jerry Smith, having the same track record as the general manager? And he said, yeah, I guess I would have to. But, Bob, (laughs) I'm the owner, so I'm not going to fire my own ass. (laughs) And you know what he really is? He's He's a generally lovable rogue. He is the real-life embodiment of the J.R. Ewing character who Larry Hagman played in the appropriately entitled long-running show that was a big deal in the 80s, Dallas. You know, he's, he's the real-life version of that guy. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Bob Costas with us. Uh, I wanted to go back to the end of the lockout. Uh, my go-to that day was MLB Network, and you were on a panel with uh, some of your colleagues. Mm. And I thought that... Um, I liked your perspective, not that you need my approval, but as you've had some time to reflect on this, what what were a, a couple of takeaways that are still with you about the lockout, why it happened, how it went down, what did we what did we learn from it? Uh, does it shape the future in any way? Well, the owner's position, their angle was that if they imposed the lockout in early December that there was less of a chance if they had let the season begin without a lockout, then the leverage switches to the players, and their fear was that the players would do, or at least would have the option of doing, what they had done back in 94. To strike late in the season, they thought in 94, uh, not so late that there wasn't time to force the owners into an agreement and still salvage the end of the regular season and then the postseason, and then to the players' surprise, the owners held firm, and there went the postseason, and that was one of the most disastrous uh, chapters in baseball history. Turned a lot of people off. Some of them still remain uh, apart from the game. Most have come back, but it took a while for many of them. It was a disastrous chapter. So the strategy for the owners was, even if short-term it looked bad, that we'll impose the lockout, the pressure will be on the players, especially on the vast majority of players who won't want to miss paychecks. There'll be the possibility that games will be lost, and with it, uh, some portion of their salary. Now, as it turned out, as part of the settlement, they're going to play 162, even though they started late. So that was the owner's strategy. From the player's standpoint, one of the things that I think they're going to have to get past, and this is not a criticism of Tony Clark. 
He's a very bright and capable and impressive guy. But a lot of the effectiveness of the Players Association derives from the history. Marvin Miller was so tough, and most of those battles back then, in the 60s and 70s and then into the 80s with Don Fear and Gene Orza, there were matters of principle then. The owners were still way behind the historical curve. They were trying to hang on to uh, a system that was not sustainable, that oppressed the players' rights. So these were not just mere negotiating points. They were moral issues or questions of principle. That's not so much the case anymore. But a good part of what animates the Players Association is references to that history. You know, Kurt Flood lost his career, and he did a courageous thing, all of which is true. Uh, Then the owners colluded against us in 1987, and that's true, too. That was found out to be true in a court of law, and they had to pay hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in damages. Yeah, all those things are true. Now, there were really only two matters of principle here. One was um, manipulation of service time. It flat out is wrong to look at a player that you know has star potential and you put him in the minor leagues for a month or two at the start of what would be his rookie season so that arbitration and free agency are put off for another full year. And by the way, even though there's a settlement, the Pittsburgh Pirates still did that again with a couple of top prospects at the start of this year. And the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles are still going to have lower payrolls, in all likelihood, for their entire roster than the Mets are paying Max Scherzer. And the Oakland A's and the Cincinnati Reds, who were on the brink of contender status last year, are either selling off or trading off valuable players and, in effect, waving the white flag and maybe getting their payrolls under control. So it's tanking. The idea of tanking and service time manipulation, those were legitimate issues for the Players Association. But I think that this idea that every one of these negotiations has to be a holy war doesn't serve either side especially well. That, especially coming from the players, that the owners and the commissioner are enemies, are are mortal enemies, rather than people who have their legitimate interests, we have ours, and we'll sit down and do a hard-nosed negotiation. And I think part of the proof of that was that the subcommittee, there were eight players on the subcommittee, um, six of whom, as I understand it, represented by Scott Boris, which is not a criticism of Boris. He's a really uh, successful agent. But his clients tend to be on the wealthier end and perhaps a little bit more radicalized. They voted 8 nothing to reject the final proposal, or the last proposal, as it turned out, from the owners. But through their own individual team player reps, the teams, the 30 teams, voted 26 to 4 to accept it. So that the rank and file felt that the increases in the uh, minimum salaries and some of the other adjustments, the, the compensation pool for players who do especially well before they're eligible for arbitration, and the adjustments in the competitive balance tax and all those sort of sorts of things, that that was enough, that they'd accomplished enough and they wanted to play ball. So there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect now within the Players Association's ranks between the radicals and the bulk of the rank and file. And there's a very long answer. Nice being with you, no. Bernie. Good night. <laughs> no, it's great. Follow up. Um, what's your sense, if any, because it's a little too early, it's not like you have visited every uh, Major League Baseball precinct, if you no. will, but... <laughs> but um, what do you think the damage will be this time around in, in terms of the fans coming back but also just feeling good about the game? Do you think there will be much damage? Or, and if you do, do you think this, this will linger longer than perhaps some of the, uh, the shutdowns, the interruptions in the past? No, I don't. In terms of the economic issues, I don't think it's much of a problem at all, especially coming off – COVID, where the 2020 season was limited to 60 games and the World Series is played in a bubble, and even last year was kind of uh, somewhat different than usual. Now it's going to be closer to normal, and I think people want baseball. They want to return to the ballpark. That's not the issue. The issue is the state of the game itself. And I've been saying this for so long that probably a lot of your listeners can recite it by heart. But I started saying it like 10, 12 years ago. Baseball is supposed to have a pleasing, leisurely pace. It's not supposed to have a lethargic pace. And the same game with the same basic outcomes that used to take two and a half, 240, 
is now taking three and a half, three forty. And in the postseason, it's taking four hours, four ten, for a four two nine inning game. That just doesn't work as an entertainment product. Even those of us who love the game have a hard time watching every pitch unless we're broadcasting the game when we have to do it, we have a hard time watching every pitch and hanging with it moment for moment when it moves at this kind of snail's pace. And on top of it, what contributes to this um, unappealing pace is something that also cuts down on action. When such a high percentage of outcomes are strikeouts, walks, and home runs, you're seeing fewer and fewer baseball plays. You're seeing fewer guys going from first to third. Uh, The analytics say the stolen base is not as important. So you don't see anything that even remotely resembles the 1980 Cardinals. Weren't as good. They were so much fun to watch play. And shifts, which may be a thing of the past starting next year, not this year, shifts actually work against some of the greatest sorts of plays that Ozzie Smith and other great infielders used to make, where they had to show their range. That doesn't mean they don't happen at all now. Of course they happen, but they happen less frequently because the ball is not in play as often, and if you're playing a pull hitter to the shift side, then you're not seeing spectacular plays. You're seeing guys positioned to take uh, to easily make what look like routine plays on what used to be base hits or play or or balls that could only be denied as base hits by spectacular plays. Who wants that? Who who wants to go ten games and never see a triple? Nobody wants that. Nobody wants a game where Nolan Ryan's career strikeout rate is pretty much equal to what the overall strikeout rate is in baseball. Four pitchers come out of the bullpen. There's a five-pitcher combination, and there are 16 strikeouts. Is that the same as watching Nolan Ryan or Sandy Koufax, and it's an exceptional thing, and they pitch nine innings and strike out 16 guys? Of course it isn't. Those are the real problems with the game. Uh, The game on the field, that's what fans care about. Once the negotiations are over, as long as they're playing, nobody cares about that. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, and I've found – uh, Jim Hugh and I have talked about it a lot. I, when I'm not saying baseball's lost me. I'm not saying that. I love baseball, but the boredom factor has been getting more intense. And oh yeah, yeah. And and, and I'm glad you talked about that. And it's just the thing of it is, is like when you when you when you bore a guy like me. I mean, you, you, that's really a sure sign of trouble because I've been able to pretty much put up with anything in terms of the entertainment value. But I want to ask you this, and I'm, I know you've been asked this a million times, but mm-hmm. here we go again. Of all the things, the ideas that have been floated out there or even tested in the minors as far as improving the pace and the quality of the game, are there a couple, three things you like? Or are there some things where you just say, no way? Well, I like a pitch clock with nobody on base. And if people think it seems extreme, I've gone back and looked at games that pop up on YouTube. I found one, uh, Game 5, in the ALCS, the clinching game for the A's against the Blue Jays from 1989. Dennis Eckersley is on the mound. It's the ninth inning. The A's have a one-run lead, and there's a man on base. And he threw three pitches in 20 seconds. Oh, now, I'm man. starting the clock in my head from the delivery of the first pitch. Okay, so that's at zero. He delivers the first pitch. He gets the ball back, the second and the third, all inside 20 seconds, with a man on base in a postseason game and a one-run lead in the ninth inning. That. <laughs> That's the way. That's closer to the way baseball should be. Now they have to have some sort of discretion. If you had a Kirk Gibson situation, you know, and it's dramatic and it's the World Series and he's stepping out of the box, you know, that kind of situation, that's a little bit different. If it's if it's David Freeze at bat in Game Six in the World Series in 2011, you don't want somebody sitting there with a stopwatch. But but on June the 10th, you know, on a Tuesday night. Let's get things moving, you know. Uh, so a, a shot, uh, a shot clock, a pitch clock with nobody on base. I'm good with. I'm skeptical about the way it might work with someone on base, where they've now proposed 19 seconds with someone on base. But my question, and no one has answered it to my satisfaction yet, is: What if you have a speedy runner on first, and you're trying to keep him close, and you're thrown over a couple of times? Is the clock ticking between pitches? And if it is. If after the second or third pickoff, now you're at 16-17, the guy can just take off. Why, why doesn't he take a 30-foot lead? 
if you've got to deliver within 19 seconds. I don't know how that part would work, but with nobody on base, I like it. I definitely like outlawing shifts, which means that you have to have two fielders on either side of second base. Uh, that, that, the, the shortstop's left instep could be on the third base side of second, and the second baseman's right instep could be on the on the first base side, but you've got to have two fielders on either side of second base. I also like the idea of limiting the number of pitchers on the roster. Now, I understand why they've expanded rosters further in April this year because of shortened spring training, but when things are normal, uh, there's no reason why you should have, and especially now this can be a problem because you have universal DH, and there are a lot of American League games, and there may soon be National League games, We have as few as three bench players and certainly no more than four in many situations because you don't have to pinch hit as often. And then you have guys, you know, 14, 15-man pitching staffs and a battalion coming out, a parade coming out of the bullpen. I think if you limited the number of active pitchers for each game on a roster, uh, and prevented manipulation by deactivating starting pitchers who pitched the day before, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, if you limited the number of pitchers on the roster, I think that that would be helpful too. A couple more things for our friend Bob Costas from HBO and MLB Network. Um, what, do you, what do you think of uh, Albert Pujols coming back for one more season in St. Louis and, of, of course, uh, reuniting with Wainwright and Molina. Um, you, I mean, no no one has to talk to you about uh, the nostalgia and the sentiment mm-hmm. and uh, just just the warm feelings that uh, are, are just part of the St. Louis baseball s- scene for, for guys that are legendary like this. It's pretty unique. I don't think we'll ever see it again. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on all of this? I think it's perfect. I think it's appropriate. Um, you could tell when Albert came back and then poetically hit a home run uh, the way Molina stepped out in front of the plate to allow the ovation and then the two of them embraced. And it, Baseball is different. I know some people outside St. Louis sneer at it. Baseball is just different in St. Louis. There are a handful of places where they are as interested in baseball as St. Louis fans are, but there is no place that combines the interest the depth of history, some places, a few, have the depth of history. But the combination of interest, depth of history, passion, but also civility and sentimentality, that honest, authentic combination is what sets St. Louis apart. So while something like this would be appropriate for almost any team where a guy had a history, in St. Louis it works especially well, and of course the universal DH makes it possible. At the beginning of the DH, you may remember this, Bernie, it actually extended the careers of fan favorites like Orlando Cepeda and Al Kaline and Carl Yastrzemski and Tony Oliva in the American League. Um, the Dodgers were able to make some good use of Albert last year as an occasional first baseman, very occasional, and a pinch hitter in certain situations against left-handed pitching, where he was still pretty effective against left-handed pitching off the bench. So I imagine that that's the way uh, that the Cardinals will use him this year uh, as a DH or occasional pinch hitter, almost exclusively against left-handed pitching. Bob, one more question, non-baseball, but uh, there's a pretty dramatic story uh, unfolding down in Augusta. You know, Tiger Woods played a practice round today, and the course was just swarmed. It was it was like a rock and roll festival. I mean, I, I don't know, man. I I just find this extraordinary that he was in that near tra- well, it was a tragic accident, but near fatal accident in January of 2021. And now, a little more than a year later, he may play in the Masters. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to say it's incomprehensible, but it. But it's stunning to me. Well, there was a thought. The first thought after that accident was, uh, would it compromise him just in the normal day-to-day activities that most of us go through? And then, by his own testimony, he wasn't sure that he'd ever be able to play competitive golf again. Now, my understanding is not being close to it. My understanding is that because of the Masters, because of the special setting, because of its significance in Tiger's own career, both his first victory when he, in effect, announced himself to the world, and then his epic comeback victory, his likely last major that he will ever win, those are both at Augusta. There's, just as Albert coming back to the Cardinals, there's something poetic about him playing in the Masters, if not this year, that sometime in the future. 
Um, I think if, if he does play, his intention would be to just play reasonably well. And if he can do that, even if he doesn't make the cut, I mean, it would be a miracle if he could contend. But even if he doesn't make the cut, but he plays reasonably well, has a moment or two where he sinks a putt and the crowd responds to that, uh, that's, that's an accomplishment. And what is undeniable, I guarantee you, CBS is hoping that he's there because he's just so compelling it doesn't matter. He could shoot 82 the first day, and the camera is going to be on him because he's just that rare kind of sports presence, that Michael Jordan kind of sports presence, where it isn't just a matter of greatness. There's some presence, there's some charisma about him, there's some aura, uh, whether you always have approved of him or not. There's something about him that makes him impossible not to watch. Bob Costas, uh, very good to talk to you again, and thanks for your time. I know you're busy, and uh, uh, happy baseball season to you. Where, where are you going to be on opening day? Do you have a game? Yeah, I have Red Sox-Yankees on Thursday at Yankee Stadium, uh, and then I have four games in California, Giants, two Dodgers, um, and a Padres game. And after that, I come to St. Louis for the Cardinals at the end of April, so I'm looking forward to that. Oh, what a great early season schedule for you. So, well, we'll talk down the line, but until then, say hello to Keith Costas for me, and then we'll, uh, we look forward to our next visit. Thank Keith you, Bob. Costas is now the baseball savant in the family. I take all my cues from him. <laughs> he's, he's outrun me. He knows more than I do at this point. He, I, I, I enjoy watching him on a hot stove, so he, uh, he does well. He's good. He's, it's a, that's a smart young man. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how it turned out that way. Despite me, he's done well. <laughs> Until next time, Bob. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks so much. Our, Bye. Our, our friend Bob Costas from HBO and MLB Network, and we'll uh, we'll come back here in, in a minute. But uh, so we got a lot to talk about here. And I'm so. I, by the way, I apologize to everyone for my voice. I feel totally fine. It's just I didn't use my voice much over the weekend, and I think it's kind of saying, "Well, easy, big boy. You go. You want to go from zero to eighty? You know." You didn't. You didn't even. War, you didn't warm up over the weekend. Let's. You know. What are you doing? So, that's all right. I'm. I feel good. I'm glad. Glad that um, we have great guests like Bob Costas. That's. That's a lot of fun. 